have to start again technical issues today we are talking about the media response to the riverside attack and this is a question posed by mutwiri and he asked will the media ever learn please talk about the media and their responses on such cases so will they ever learn it means that there's something that they did wrong back in the past so what did they do i remember an example there's a lady called victoria rubadiri i think you know her and she was covering the westgate attack back in the day when it happened and she mentioned the position of the people who were hiding from the west uh, westgate attack they were actually in the kitchen and she said that they're hiding in the kitchen i was shocked that ntv had not trained her for this kind of thing and that she would actually say that it was shocking for me so anyway i felt that this was wrong for a number of reasons one the attackers in westgate they would know where these guys are and they would reassign their resources to go and finish off those guys so that's a bit problematic for them because now their position has been exposed. And then there was another issue that I saw. Like you see uh, the guys on TV, the media, they're actually showing this, uh, our security forces as they're moving into Westgate. That was something I saw back in the day. And you'd actually see the number of people who are moving in, the type of weapons they're moving in with, and the direction in which they're moving in. So I'm thinking if somebody's communicating to the terrorist or if the terrorist can see the media, like our media, then they'd actually see, they'd actually plan ahead of these guys who are coming in and they'd inflict as much casualties as possible on them, even though they might be overpowered eventually. Remember that their aim is to inflict as many casualties as possible. So I felt that these things were a bit problematic for the media and I didn't like it when they do it. And I wanted to give an example of why the truth is so important, why not saying that the people are in the kitchen is so important. Why not showing the tactical operations is so important? And I was using uh, Winston Churchill, right, to give this example. And what he said was that a bodyguard of lies. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for following. So this is what Winston Churchill said, right? That the truth is so important that it must be guarded by a bodyguard of lies, right? And in this case, they did not realize how important the truth was. And the, the British and the Americans knew that from back in the day. Because like when they were trying to invade uh, France to take it away from Hitler, they had to use inflatable tanks and they put them in a region of France called Palace de Calis, right, something. And in that region, the Germans actually felt that they were, the Americans were, and the British were going to invade through that region. Because when they flew their planes over there, they had few planes, but I think they could still fly some. They would actually see tanks on the ground. But these tanks were inflatable toys because the Americans, the Allies, were trying to hide the truth that they were going to move through Normandy, right? So that's why the truth is so important, especially when you're conducting an operation. Hide things from the enemy. Our media did not do that. I was a bit disappointed. So anyway, that operation, that uh, operation in uh, France, it was called Operation Fortitude. Another nickname, Bodyguard. Why? Truth guarded by a bodyguard of lies. So anyway, I also felt that at certain times the media failed to ask the right questions and followed the wrong narrative. You remember back in Westgate what they said? They say that there was uh, mattresses were burning and you could actually see smoke rising from Westgate. And people are like, why are mattresses burning? And the Nakumat guys, I think, they say that ma mattresses are, are on the ground floor and it didn't quite add up because those guys were not supposed to be on that floor or on that section of the mall at that time so there's one guy who did not follow this narrative and his name was mohad chopevu and i think john alamnamu so what they did they took a helicopter and we actually saw that those things were not mattresses that were burning so in that case a section of the media did not follow the narrative and they went ahead and asked the right questions but the rest they had to wait for these guys to do that for them. And that's why Mohaji Chopev was so famous and John Alanamo. And you guys remember the Peketoni narrative. Al-Shabaab themselves, they are saying that we are the ones carrying out this terrorist attack. They are the ones who are saying that. But the government is saying that this thing is politically instigated. And they're actually mentioning that, look, look, at look, they're playing tribal numbers. And that's the danger when the media does not pursue 
uh, the correct narrative and it follows the negative narrative. I felt that at this time they did not adequately follow the right narrative because many people are still believing that it was politically instigated. Even though Al-Shabaab had claimed responsibility for it and even though those guys who came, they were clearly looking for other people. They were clearly terrorists. That's what I can say. So anyway, the government lies for a number of reasons. It lies for political reasons, for political mileage, so that now it can place the blame on the on the on the political enemies, let's say on the opposition. It can save face and say, you see, it's not us, it's these guys who are doing it. Get these guys out of here, vote for us, or something like that. They do it to save face. Cause the principle, the principal function of a government is to provide security for its citizens. That is the principal reason why we pay taxes. For me, I'd hope that that would be the only reason. But anyway, it's the principal reason why we pay taxes, so that they can provide the security. And when they fail, it's obvious, because people are dying. You get. So they do it so as to save face. To say, no, not so many people died. No, we did this, but those guys are at fault. You know, all of, all of those things, right? We did not get the right information at the right time. They lie. And it is upon the media to follow the right narrative, right? And they also lie for tactical reasons. Sometimes they lie so that they can throw the enemy off guard and so that they can do this, right? They also lie to hide their incompetence. Like who? Olelenku. So anyway, so those are the things that happened. And uh, yes, the media also fails at a certain time. It also failed in the past when it when it came to being sensitive to the families that were affected by, by the tragedies. I don't think this is a recent failure, but it was a failure back in the day. You guys remember 1998, the bomb blast? You could actually see everything. The footage was unedited. You can see the, uh, the bodies. You could see the, the legs separated from the bodies. You could see the blood. You could see everything. And that was, it was not the first time that we had a terror attack because we had another one in, in, in the 1970s, mid-1970s. But nothing ever on this scale. And it was shocking for everybody. And the media made a lot of mistakes, understandably, because it was the first time they were ever dealing with certain things like that. When it came to the Westgate attack, we tried, right? When it came to the Garissa attack, we kind of tried, but the gruesome images that were coming from there were really shocking also at the same time. Now, here's another thing. Images do not, do not have to be shocking. They do not have to be gory for them to be moving, right? Like, if you remember that Westgate, uh, Westgate attack, there's a mother and a daughter who are lying on the floor. That was a very, very moving image, for me, personally speaking. When you see security for, for officers trying to get people to safety, that's a very, very moving image. And you, they, it doesn't have to be gory for it to be to be moving. You get? Yeah, so that's the thing. Again, we made mistakes ba back in the past. I'll talk about images later as, as we go on. So what did the media do this time? Like, did they learn from the past mistakes, the mistakes that I've mentioned? Uh, just to mention one thing that I don't really want to forget. The media have this kind of thing. I hear that during their training, they're told, do not trust anyone, even your mother. Verify every bit of information. So that's why it's important for them to follow the right narrative. Other things, being sensitive to the family, uh, not showing the images of security forces as they're doing their operations, or not mentioning where guys are as they're hiding, right? So anyway, what did the media do this time? Did they get things right? So anyway, they kept the location of their victims secret, of the, of the people who are in the danger zone secret. And that's very, very, very nice. They did not mention it. Me, I did not hear it online or any other place. And they urged other people to do the same. Keep it on the hash hash. If they text you, do not say where these guys are. Do not even call them. So I felt that that was very, very nice and very important. I could, I actually attribute that more so to the bloggers than to the media because the first place that I saw this kind of information, people don't reveal this, don't say this, verify your information. I saw it first from the bloggers. I did not see it first from the media. And I felt that the media was kind of like 
following what the bloggers were saying and doing as opposed to following what their training is supposed to teach them to do. They actually have a training manual on this kind of thing. The Media Council of Kenya will actually mention it. So anyway, but it's good. Regardless of uh, how they got to, 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 to know that showing Im images is bad or telling where the locations of people is bad, it doesn't really matter as long as they did not do that, right? And you have to give them credit for that. They really, really tried to keep that secret in this time. And I'm happy that they did. So let me move to another one. There are no images of security operations, right? No images of security operations as they were going on. And I felt that that was important, right? So most of them, they had control of the area. Uh, <clears throat> I mostly attribute this thing of not showing security images and entry points of security forces because the security forces had control of the area. As in now the security forces, they were controlled. I'll do that the last thing tomorrow. And uh, yes, so the media couldn't show certain things or do certain stuff because they were really, really controlled where you stay, what you report and all of those things. So I felt that. So anyway, thank you. I'll keep up with these nice reflections. Thank you. And uh, <clears throat> so just to mention some of the things that I felt they, they had not learned even though they should have learned, right? Some of them focused on the right angles of the story, I must admit. Others focused on the wrong angles. For example, I was watching Checkpoint, I think it was last night, right? Last night was Sunday. So Sophia Wanuna was equating failure to people dying. And there's guys, guys around her, the security forces, are, the security guys around her, they are trying to find nice ways of telling her that that's no, not how you judge success. The government security spoken was finding a hard time doing so. And other security guys were also finding a hard time doing so. Because I believe that they should be trained on, on these kind of things. Like what, how do you measure success? So that you can ask the right questions. Because if you simply say that people died, that means they, there was a failure somewhere. It doesn't really show that you have an in-depth understanding of how these things work. And you should actually have that before you go on air. So that was my opinion. Guys need to do more training on that, right? Again, you remember that there was inadequate training before uh, Victoria Rubadiri went on air back in the day, right? So anyway, there was a question that Linda Ogutu was asking part of a panel. Like the time taken to rescue people, she was really adamant on that. Too much time, that means there was a problem. Too much time, that means there was a problem. Again, that means there was inadequate information given to these media guys when it comes to such security forces because the time taken is not really a measure of success, right? And yeah, you can remember that. You can move to other examples. How long did it take before this, like there's a Russian event that took, I, I don't know how many days, but a lot of days. Some of these things, they take weeks, right? So these guys need to be educated. They need to have examples at hand and all of those things instead of this. Then there's another panelist. This one I'll talk about it later. She was on the news gang, right? I can't, I don't know her name. And she was criticizing Kimiko, the foreign journalist, New York journalist. And she was critiz criticizing her on the basis of the tone of which she spoke. Tone is a highly subjective uh way of analyzing things. Because your tone and my tone are kind of different. Actually, you can actually see your own tone in something. So I felt when it comes to analyzing certain things, these guys need to be taught between subjective analysis and objective analysis. Because most of it is subjective. Like when you equate failure to people dying, that's subjective. When you equate a problem to the time taken, that's subjective. When you equate somebody's response or somebody's writing on an issue on the basis of tone, that's subjective. We need to have more objective analysis in our media. These guys need to be trained on this kind of stuff, in my opinion. And then I saw a complaint by an MP, the Nyeri MP, I can't remember his name, and he was complaining that as soon that day, on the day of the attack, NTV was carrying out some what he called Al-Shabaab propaganda. Like they were saying that Kenya was being attacked because the West, we are supporting the West because we are in Somalia and all of those things. So I'm kind of like, these guys need to be taught on the issues to discuss at that time and how to discuss them. 
and how not to propagate certain kind of things, right? Again, you remember, Victoria Rabiri was, uh, Rubadiri was at NTV. So these guys need to shape up if what the Nyeri MP was saying was true. So anyway, there's, a, there's footage of an insensitive kind of scenario. A woman is walking. She's trying to get away from the riverside attack. And this journalist is on her face. And she's asking, I need to get to a safe place. I need to get to a safe place. Twice she asked, but the journalist kept on asking her questions. I understand. Journalists need to get the story. It's very, very important for them. But at the same time, it's really, really important if guys chill and look for somebody else. These guys are undergoing trauma. They might need counseling afterwards. And uh, putting them in that kind of position where they don't really know how to react. There's a camera guy on in her face. She's running from an attack. She wants to communicate to a family or somebody. Okay. Doesn't give much room for, for her doing what she would probably have done if she were in a normal kind of scenario. So that's my opinion on that. Uh, journalist apologizes for an improper... Sometimes they actually behave very well. I remember this is a journalist on News Gang again. And he apologized for asking a particular question that he thought was an inappropriate at that time. And I felt that that was very nice because he's apologizing in front of other journalists. Joageyo, Victoria, what's her name? Uh, Yvonne Okwara and Linas Kakai. And I felt that was very nice. And another one. Because they were, it's being honest. And we need honesty in the media. So this, that, that guy, he did very well. And he was there during uh, the first moments of the attack. So I felt that was nice. Thank you, Chege. Thank you very much. So anyway, another point, right? Journalist helps in the rescue. Uh, yeah, there's a journalist. If you saw the article on New York Times, there's a journalist who actually, you can see the press, it's written on him, and he's actually helping to carry somebody from the scene of the attack. I felt that that was very important because that journalist, he left the story and he looked at the person and he catered to the needs of the person. And I felt that that was very powerful because there's another journalist who actually slapped somebody who was blocking let's say a media briefing so these guys really get passionate about getting that story because their bosses are on their case and they know that this this kind of uh scenario it can make or break their careers right yes amanda kenya is a very dangerous place but not all places in kenya right and perhaps you can make it better slowly so this case he left that story because this case, Guys are passionate about that. That's why this guy was slapping us, those other guys to sit down so that he can see the media briefing. But this guy, he left the story and he focused on the person. And you can see the media, what they're doing. They're apologizing for their wrongs. They're focusing on the person. They're trying to learn as much as possible as they can. Because they didn't show images this time, right? There are others who are making mistakes, true, right? Like the ones who... The ones who are spreading Al-Shabaab propaganda this time guys who are asking irrelevant questions or bad questions or uninformed questions. So you can, they are trying, but at the same time, the areas they need to, to improve on. So anyway, ironically, I saw this on the New York Times, this image, and I'll speak about that. I was happy when I saw John Alan Namu arrive at the scene. I was very happy because I thought the government pushes narratives. And you can actually see the narratives that were starting to, it was, they were starting to push. Like, these guys might release images of old photos and all of those things. And I'll speak about that, propaganda war. And John Alan Namu was there and he was trying to get a picture of the whole entire area. And I actually felt that at least somebody will speak the truth. So our journalists are still important and they sp still speak the truth. And we've de identified more, many of them. And these guys were the same guys who told the truth during Westgate. So big up to those guys, right? So anyway... Here's another thing. I saw the Media Council of Kenya, like their handbook on terrorism or something. And this is what I got was very dangerous. These guys, they are planning to lie to us. They're actually planning to lie. And how are they doing that? Right? How are they doing that? So the Media Council of Kenya is advising journalists to avoid certain words when they are reporting on terrorism. Right? Here are some of those words. Kafir. Kafiri, Watuabara, Downies, I think it means Watuabara, like those who are down in the... Okay. 
and then nyuele ngumu nyuele ngumu i don't understand it perhaps it's coastal slang i don't know but the kafir kafiri watu wabara thank you chege i am glad that you found it educative so one one of the reasons yes i will say hi to her right so one of the reasons right why they say this is because that people don't discriminate right like if you mentioned kafir kafir all the, all the time then people learn to differentiate between ordinary kenyans and kafir they might actually start saying that three kafir died four kafir died or something of that sort which is actually dehumanizing right so i can understand why they would, wouldn't want such words spoken right so here's why i say that propelling to to life for to us like when they say that advise their journalists not to use words like fiery cleric right kiongozi tatanishi wa kidini how can you advise journalists not to say that right how would we have known that this guy i hope you remember back in the day his name was rogo i can't remember his first name right how would we know that he's a bad cleric if the media never say that he's a bad cleric or if they only say that he's a blood he's a bad cleric they did not say that he's yeye ni kiongozi tatanishi wa kidini right and when the police shot him what would our, our reaction have been if we did not know that he was he was uh, a bad a fiery cleric right if we had not known that our reaction would be very different we'd actually be sympathizing with the guy yes they should not commit extrajudicial killings right which is very bad right but at the same time we need full information so that we know if the police say that we did this because of this then we'd know okay yes you did that because he's a he's a fiery cleric right but this is how you should handle fiery clerics right but if we didn't know that then we'd actually be sympathizing with this guy and perhaps sympathizing with other fiery clerics without knowing and when did we start calling a spade a, sp uh, a big spoon right if somebody is a divisive religious leader he is a divisive religious leader and you should say it you should not lie about it you should not sugarcoat it but this is what our media council is teaching guys their journalists to do right and imagine his supporters if they if there was not this argument that he was a fiery cleric right then his supporters would be fired up they would have that high moral authority and they would fight but if you say that he was a fiery cleric then they would tone down a bit <coughs> and they would only focus on the extra judicial killing part of, part of it not that they killed a, a good man you get so anyway that's one of the things they actually say that people should not use the word militia the journalists so imagine police they come into an area and they use overwhelming force and we didn't know that they are using overwhelming force over a militia then we we think why are these guys using overwhelming force over criminals we start blaming them blaming them blaming them but if you use the right word then we know hey these are militia and police will use overwhelming force my son get out of that thing <coughs> that's the kind of thing i'm saying the truth will set you free at all times don't lie about it when you when you don't use words when you advise a journalist not to use words such that hanisi jihadist or islamist right obama avoided using such words and what happened isis grew it took over iraq it took over syria and it took over which other country it took over libya look at libya today when you do not define your enemy right then you do not know what you're fighting against when you cannot define your enemy then who are you arguing against when you're preventing rad rad radicalization we need to learn that certain things do not work others do define your enemy define what he's doing and then counter it because you now you you be countering something specific so anyway there is this other guy and this is what he said right we are in a battle and that more of more than half of this battle more than half of it is taking place in the battlefield of the media and we are in a race for the hearts and the minds of the ummah the ummah is kind of like the worldwide muslim community and this guy who said it he was the successor to osama bin laden and he knew that half of the battle will be fought in the media 
and it's a battle for the race of the hearts of Muslims. So there needs to be a dialogue among Muslims. But how can we encourage that dialogue when we hide what Al-Shabaab is claiming that they are fighting for, and that is Islam? Because when we hide that fact, then we do not give authority to other people to speak about it. Because when other people speak about it, they are condemned. People speak ill about them, and they are within the Muslim community. But if we mention it, we give them support, so that now they have a voice to mention it. And I wanted to give an example, right? There is Imam Tawahidi. I talked about him in the past. And he wrote a book. The book is The Tragedy of Islam, Admissions of a Muslim Imam. He's actually talking about Islam himself. There's another one, A Battle for the Soul of Islam by M. Zuhid Jasir, Jasar or something. There is an internal dialogue that needs to take place within Islam. And there are people trying to push that dialogue within Islam itself. But if we hide the fact that this, this problem is arising from Islam, from the failure of dialogue within Islam, then we do not give voice to these other guys. We do not give them support to speak about it. Because now, <clears throat> when people say that these are criminals, then what right does an imam have about speaking about Islam when you are saying it's about criminals? But if you say this is Islamic terrorism, then that imam has a, a platform to speak about Islam, especially to the Muslim youth, right? If you say that these guys are attacking because these are jihadist guys coming and attacking because of jihad, then that Muslim karik now has a platform to say that jihad is this, it is not this. He can speak now about that. But if we say they are criminals, then what right does he have to come and speak about it? What impetus do we give to him to speak about it? So anyway, just trying to move a bit faster. The international media, because we had a problem with the international media. And this was a question from a friend of mine. Her name is Betty, and she asked it from Instagram, right? How come foreign media had pictures of a fallen before security agencies had told us how many people had died? Valid question, right? Because people are asking how many people have died, how many people have died, and some guys are asking. Uh, these guys are setting up donation for blood, but you don't know how many people have died. So are they going to steal our blood or something? That was a question that I asked by one of the bloggers online. So anyway, imagine you're hearing about what is, what is happening in your home, right, from somebody who's outside your home. And your wife is telling you not to worry. And you're seeing images, perhaps your kids are in danger, or perhaps they're running away or whatever. You see, you wouldn't want people to be showing images of what is happening in your home. At the same time, you'd be wanting your wife to tell you the truth. And if she's not telling you the truth, then you'd rather see those images so you can determine the truth. Because the truth will always set you free. It's more important than these other lies. So anyway, the reason why those guys get those images ahead of us is because we have uh, we are afraid of showing them that's number one and because we're still learning what to show and what to show so that's one of the reasons why we fear another re the reason why we fear is because we fear the government right so n the new york times shows images of dead people on their website and social media platforms kenyans were up in arms about it the hashtag someone tell new york times came about the media council of kenya issued an ultimatum 24 hours take it down i don't think they took it down guys told kimiko she was the incoming bureau chief that she's not welcome in kenya and a journalist i saw this tweet about kimiko from a journalist wallace kantai so all the vitriol that came against kimitu in my opinion journalists were the ones feeling it and you can actually see online. And the same journalists are the ones who are going to complain that journalists are in danger. Or they don't have a safe working, working environment or a conducive working environment. And here they couldn't come to the defense of Kimiko. Lina Skakai on NewsGun actually came to the defense of this lady. Because he said it's not her fault. It's the editorial team. So if you have a problem, go to the editorial team, not to her. 
he actually defended her but her fellow journalists were there and tomorrow they'll complain about another, another journalist in another area so anyway i just wanted to talk about a couple of things remember the nice attack in france well you guys remember the small boy i think it was a boy he was dead on the ground and there was blood on his head and there was a small doll next to him and he became the face of the nice attack in france right you remember back in they were in Syria, right? In Aleppo, Syria. There's a boy who had an open wound on his forehead. There was blood rushing down. He was covered in dust debris from the places where he was. I think it was a, a military attack. So he was cast, covered in dust debris. He was dazed, just looking ahead, covered in blood, dust debris all over him. And he was in an ambulance. And it caught the attention of the world. There was this three-year-old Syrian boy, right? He washed up on, this, on the shores of the Mediterranean, I think closest to the Turkey border. He was lying like this, head first, and he was dead. He had drowned in the Mediterranean. And that image captured the world. When you go to the New York Times website, the, kind of like the image I saw today, that image was not as gruesome as the images you'd see when you just Google Syria, when you Google Nice attack, when you Google uh, other images, like the recent attacks in, in Paris, even the Yellow Vest protest, they're not as gruesome as that. Yes, they showed dead images, and I could not actually tell whether it was a Kenyan because I saw some, you can't even see their faces. But guys were up in arms against that. And it's the same New York Times that had some of the best images about the resilience of Kenyans. A journalist leaving his camera and going or whatever and going to help somebody. Like ambulances trying to cover a woman up. Police trying to rescue people. That was also the New York Times that showed that. But we forgot all of that. And we focused on an image that did not even come as close as to what we saw in Westgate attack. And remember what happened when guys saw the Westgate attack. They, they were fired up. All over the world, guys were fired up. Croatia, they actually imitated those guys dead on the ground. Yes, images do not have to be glory for them to be moving. But at certain times, go gory images, they bring people's attention and denial is impossible. And in this case, I don't feel that the New York images were merited the kind of attack that we had on the New York Times or the one that we had on Kimiko especially when it came to our fellow journalists. I think that was shameful, in my opinion. So anyway, I, do you guys remember the Congo? I think this is my last point. Do you guys remember the Congo? King Leopard took over the Congo. He killed 10 million people. How did he kill them? Uh, <clears throat> those guys were put on rubber plantations and they were to bring, you know, those, that raw material to, the, to, to Leopard and his company. It was a rubber company in, Z in Congo. And if they did not meet their quota, because everybody was given a quota, then he would kill them. He would hit them with a, a whip made of hippopotamus hide, which is very hard, and actually kill if you got to 100 lashes. And he would cut their hands or their feet. And before he started committing these atrocities, the first thing he did was to close the Congo Free State to outsiders, to foreigners. So everything that was happening was happening inside and it was under closed doors. Nobody from the outside world knew it. But the missionaries started get, getting wind of it. And how did this story break? There's a missionary. Her name was Alice, Sele, Alice Harris, right? And when she was in the Congo, she was actually in a honeymoon on the Congo. And somebody came up to her. And he opened a leaf. And that leaf had hands of his wife and of his daughter. They ha their hands had been severed because they could not meet their quota. And there was an attack on their village because that village did not meet their quota. And what did this lady do? She asked this man to pose with those hands for an image. And she sent this image to 49 cities in 200 meetings. Gruesome images of hands cut. And you started seeing hands all over, people being cut and all of those things. And that changed everything. 
because everybody now focused on the Congo. And Belgium had to take it from King Leopard. And the death stopped. And this was a foreign journalist. A journalist who was not Belgian, who the King Leopard could not get to. Was not African King Leopard could not get to. Remember that our journalists are afraid of sometimes of airing some things. And it, there are only a couple of them who are less fearful. And if we start making foreign journalists afraid of telling a specific story, then it will come back to bite us. Because at certain times, we need them to tell the stories that we cannot say. And we need their platforms to reach a certain audience so that things can change. Or perhaps to have just told the story. Right? So I don't feel that the attack on the New York Times was merited. That e image was not as gruesome as you would see when you Google any of those other images that you'd see online. If that image was the one I saw today, perhaps they deleted some other image. And I feel that we misplaced our anger. We took it on the on foreigners, which is always easy to do, on outsiders, instead of placing them where they they should always be, on the terrorists. And if the government fails, on the government. And if the media fails, on correcting the media. But it's always easier to have a scapegoat. So anyway, that's what I had for today. <clears throat> I kind of like mis mixed review. Some journalists did good, some journalists did bad. Some responses are good, some responses are bad. We kind of like learned from some things. We kind of like did not learn from other things. So that's what I had for today. Tomorrow I'll finish this series on Riverside and then we'll get back to normal programming, if I can call it that. So anyway, thank you for watching. Have a good day. Bye-bye.